Restaurant Unstoppable episode 628 with Chef Kim Alter. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, Chef Kim Alter. Chef, are you feeling unstoppable today? Today I am. Yes, that is what we like to hear. So growing up in Laguna Beach, California, Chef Kim Alter is a graduate of the California Culinary Academy. She went on to work in some of the Bay Area's most notable restaurant kitchens before joining the Daniel Patterson Group, where she served as executive chef for Haven and Plum in Oakland, California. Today, Kim is the chef owner of Nightbird and the adjoining cocktail concept Linden Room in San Francisco's Hayes Valley. I cannot wait to dive into your story to find out how you got to where you are today but let's get that motivational inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra what do you got for us I mean it's hard to pick one and I was even asking my staff like what they would say that I say all the time but I think that in my brain and what I think about all the time is uh said by an unknown person but it's a uh, success isn't just about what you have accomplished it's about what you've inspired other people to do Ooh. and I think that in my age and my evolution, that is something I focus on more than anything else. Yeah, and it's amazing once you start to focus on the other people and existing to serve others, how things in your own life start to take off and start to you know move in the right direction. Have you noticed that? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Great. So where does it make sense to dive into your story? When did you know that this was going to be your life, your path? You know, I think I always think about when I moved from... Um, a different school from sixth grade to junior high when that super awkward phase and trying to make friends when you're like a preteen. And so I always applied cooking to my projects because people love food, you know? So if I did a science project where there had to be like a, an, an atom, I would make a cake and then I'd make mini ones to give to my classmates. And I think seeing that acceptance and that excitement made me just really start loving food. And, you know, I worked in two thing, two places outside of a restaurant, a head shop and a pager uh, shop that dates me. Um, and uh, then it was just restaurants from 15 on until now. So I'm curious. This is something that I am just my own personal curiosity. When you when you were making, were they cupcakes you said? I would, yeah. What I mean, it would always change. It, the example that I said, I remember making a round cake that looked like an atom and a nucleus, and I had used like a jawbreaker in the middle, and then I made little mini ones for my uh, for classmates like in seventh grade. Bring us to deeper into that experience of being able to present this gift to your your fellow students and what it was like when they saw it and when they ate it and how that made you feel it made me feel accepted you know when I walk in the dining room of the restaurant it's the same feeling you can see the happiness the food memories which is such an important part of our job I think um, is bringing people back to that place and for me seeing the students or my peers eat you know a cupcake um, and then them you know want to talk to me about it afterwards it, it made me be able to move into this new school that I didn't know anybody and have like a connection with people and I obviously then loved that feeling it was almost like you know when you get like a high and you realize that this is something that's great and I would do it for like every project after that yeah I have this little theory running that uh, passion comes from being acknowledged and when we're good at something and when people acknowledge that we're good at something or they accept us for what we're doing uh, it's part of Maslow's hierarchy of needs supposedly that we need to feel like we belong that others love us and that we're accepted and when when we give we get right we, we get that that acknowledgement like wow you're good at this this is really this is great like in it's so powerful. So if there's somebody who's doing something in food food related and they're good at it, and on your team, acknowledge them, accept them, let them know that they're uh, do good at their job or whatever it is, and that can be so powerful. Do you want to reflect on that? No, I mean, obviously, uh, we were just talking about you know yelling and throwing things and just the change in our industry right now as a whole, mental health, all these things. Don't get as much, you know, you don't get a better product at the end as you would when you're communicating to your staff like humans, giving them acknowledgement, telling them that they're doing a good job and they wanna do better. You know, They wanna actually stand behind you. Most of my team's been with me for over a year, two years since we've been open. And I think that comes from us like treating each other well and giving that acceptance and telling them that they're doing a good job and they're learning and they're taking that with them on top yes. of just getting paid. Like I they look it. at it as a career. Awesome, awesome stuff. Great way to get this thing started. So you said that you, that was kind of your first real food memory 
bakery or when you knew that this was kind of kind of be what you wanted to do uh did you work in any restaurants before the california culinary i did okay i, I, worth I mean anything worth spending some time on I don't really talk about <laughs> Laguna Beach that much, to be honest. <laughs> I love Laguna. It was super special growing up there. But I pretty much consider my culinary career starting in San Francisco. Okay. Um, and that would be Ocarello for sure because I worked full-time at Ocarello when I was in the Col Culinary Academy. And okay. that changed my life. She's a mentor and a friend to me today. We still speak almost daily. Suzette and Greshman is yeah. who we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, she's amazing. So you got your start working there before you went to culinary or uh, around the same time? Same time. Okay. I, you know, went to the back kitchen, you know, knocked on it nice, and gave nice. my resume and uh, she hired me and I worked full time when I was in school. Okay. So what, get into the, the details about Chef uh, Suzette Greshman. What was it exactly? Am I saying her name correctly? Gresham. Oh, Gresham, yeah. thank you. Um, uh, I mean, I could go on forever about her. She, you know, I, I was just talking the other day about how she actually hired me because I kind of went in there with a little bit of cockiness, like, you need to hire me kind of a, a thing. And she told me years later she hired me just to kind of beat that out of me, which she did um, <laughs> on a day to day. And uh, I, you know, my eyes really got open at seeing what a real kitchen was like, you know, a four star, she's two Michelin stars um, kitchen. And I'm not going to lie, I probably wanted to quit a lot um, because I didn't realize at what level, um, you know, the restaurants I worked at in Laguna were nothing like Ocarello. And, uh, but I just put my head down, worked harder, and I've taken so much of her knowledge and try to, you know, give it to my staff as well about just not thinking about recognition necessarily, just trying to do a good job, try to make the customers happy. And in the end, that's what we, what we try to do every day. Okay. I want to pull back some layers here. So you said that uh, she wanted to beat this uh, kind of ego out of you that you had when you walked through the door initially. How did she do that? What if somebody comes to us and they have this chip on their shoulder, but they are, they're clearly talented. We want them, but we also want to beat that ego out of them. Like, it, What approach should we take in doing that? Well, she definitely is a motherly type. I would never say that she, I've maybe heard her raise her voice a few times. With me, she just wanted me to understand that if I didn't come into a restaurant with an open mind and a humbleness, which... I feel I'm a pretty humble person now. And I was back then. I just thought that's how, you know, you got a job. Um, but she every day taught me something new. She showed me that I, if I wasn't doing it correctly, that uh, how to do it right. And, you know, it made me learn that I had a lot to learn. And I, to this day, carry that every day. If I'm not learning something, something's wrong. And I want to learn something from my dishwasher, from my cook, from my friends, from my mentors still. It's a Every day we're evolving, every day we're growing, and she was able to, you know, kind of create that in me. I love it, and it's so true. As soon as you think you know everything, as soon as you reach, you think you like, okay, I made it to that point. I don't have to learn anymore. Now I'm just going to run my business. That's when everybody else surpasses you because exactly. it never ends. You there's always somebody who can teach you something. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Great I'm, lesson there. That's what I say whenever I hire somebody. I'm like, I want to learn from you. So, so teach yeah. me something. Awesome, I love it. So you said you wanted to quit at one point. Um, A lot of times, maybe. <laughs> so <laughs> take us to that last that, week. Take us to <laughs> that, that that point um, where you got the closest to quitting, and then why didn't you? I mean, I was young. I was 18, and I think that I'd never really experienced failure. Um, because, you know, maybe I never put myself out there. You know, I was always really um, successful academically and with my friends, with my family, and with jobs I had carried before. I'd never been in that amount of pressure. And I just think, you know. Were you failing? Were you, were you like, coming up short in your mind? In you more in my mind than in, like, I don't think I ever got close to being fired. Mm. But just not being perfect really bothered me. It still bothers me to this day. Like, I don't want to be called out in front of somebody, and that's what would happen in a kitchen. And it took me a while to get used to that's just what happens you know you're gonna do it wrong it's gonna happen it's probably gonna happen every day and you're gonna learn from it and just don't do it again and that's what happened I stopped doing it and I just progressed and you know I think I always gave myself timelines in my head all right you have a couple weeks to master this and if you can't master it you need to figure out a way to do it or it's not for you and I kind of you know always mastered it thank god and uh Every job's hard. It's always hard when you start in that acceptance, that being with a new team, being with new rules and new kitchen and, and being able to be with Suzette and her to explain to me that, you know, you need to learn and grow. It's going to you're going to have a learning curve made me accept myself that I'm not going to be perfect every time, which you want to be. Yeah. So it sounds like the big lesson why you didn't quit was because you learned that it's OK not to be perfect 
all the time, especially in an industry in, in the a, beginning, in the condition. Well, in the beginning, but you know, it, there's a lot to learn, especially early on. You're not going to be perfect, but as long as you're better than you were the day before, right? Exactly. As long as you're moving in that right, that Constant right direction. Evolution. So, the, what, is it safe to say the biggest lesson she taught you were humility and humbleness? Any other big lessons that's worth hovering over before moving to the next experience in your career? I would definitely say that she was. I mean, also giving me a base idea of what a restaurant was like, and you know quality and all the other things that all restaurants I think that should teach all cooks but for on a personal level yeah for sure and I think that that has made me a stronger person today and made people want to work with me um, and you know I'm just a normal person who's pretty humble no ego I love it so any uh, experiences at the California Culinary Academy any folks professors mentors that kind of influence where you are today I don't want to say no, but I, I always say that I learned more, obviously, working at Ocarello, and it helped me. I, I mean, I failed a few classes for falling asleep in class, for sure, because I was just exhausted from working at Ocarello. But I couldn't pick somebody that necessarily changed my life. It was the stepping stone to give me the opportunity to get in Suzette's door. That's how I kind of look at it. I don't think she would have let me um, stage if I hadn't had an edu or at least been starting an education it's showing that you're experience. serious yeah right? exactly yeah. and back then it was a lot harder to get a job than it is now oh, oh yeah that's for sure especially yeah. in the best kitchens yes. um so i mean in in the intro i said that you've worked in some of uh california bay area's best kitchens uh obviously that's not doing you justice just real quick kind of like rifle through some of the the places that you came up through uh, not getting into too much detail but just kind of setting up the listeners real quick i mean just in all honesty, I, I worked in a lot of places because a lot of times I held multiple jobs. I try, you know, I the highlights, the places that really affected and changed me were definitely Ocarello. Moss is the place I went to afterwards, which is no longer there. Definitely kind of uh, made me understand French brigades, and um, it was a little aggressive. I'd have to say, m you know, working in the front of the house at Ocarello taught me how to business and also being able to be more comfortable with customers, which has definitely uh, made my business now better. Moving to Chicago and seeing something outside of California was important, so Nomi was amazing to see what it's like to be in the Midwest and deal with winters and um, different, not having farmers all, you know, I go to the farmer's market every day in San Francisco. You can't do that when it's 10 below. So that opened my eyes to, you know, maybe more technique than just relying on the produce. And I mean, Man Race obviously changed my life in the sense of how I cook and mm. how I process and understand um, vegetables and meat and everything and then Ubuntu I think definitely changed my life too on working on farms and growing vegetables and utilizing every single part of it and then working at Aqua with Ron Boyd and him kind of giving me my manager style and really trying to learn to teach people and not just be an aggressive bitch cook sometimes <laughs> which definitely happened sorry um and then you know i you know worked at a, a Wait, couple so uh this is with george chef george uh, marone Mar no, no no i actually worked there with ron boyd okay. uh, laurent manrique was the um head chef and then ron ran the kitchens and he is now my partner in life and partner in business um and we've worked in multiple restaurants together and he kind of it was my first step as the executive sue where he like you know i ran the pass i did the ordering i helped with the menu i taught the cooks um and it kind of changed my process on how i approached people to teach them well, was this at ubuntu or uh, you getting aqua. Kind of aqua sorry a lot of i mean look at I, your lineup I look at this experience I but I, I love it because i mean it's like what i would tell somebody who approached me if anybody ever approached me and said like what's the best thing to do to like, become successful in this industry go out there and work for the best do whatever it takes to get on the best teams and you will become the average of those you surround yourself with it's a it's a probably overplayed saying but it's so true it's so true and like this look at your your experience um i mean it's i don't even know where to spend time because there's so much really great experiences there uh well, you, you meant sorry go ahead. i was just gonna say i 100 percent agree with that i say it all the time you know i again not to date myself but you know you couldn't google how to do something so i really wanted to learn i wanted to be the best sous chef so if a cook came up to me and was like well how do i make that i could just tell them i wouldn't have to like look it up and i tell my cooks that all the time i'm like don't jump into being a manager don't jump into being a chef really learn how to cook don't just put something in a bag understand why proteins act the way they do, understand where a vegetable comes from, work on a farm, work in all different types of restaurants so you can figure out 
what's best for you and your path will be stronger. Well, you need a, you need a foundation. You yeah. need you need the basics, uh, the muscle memory, all that stuff down, the knowledge, the basic food knowledge that to be your foundation. So you can use that for creativity exactly. in the future. But even beyond that, you need to sur- you, you can't just rely on cookbooks and videos to learn how to cook because there's so much more to success in this industry. It's it's how you conduct yourself. It's it's how you manage relationships and that's the other stuff you're going to pick up by working for these incredible restaurateurs is Mm -hmm. their culture their 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 standards and all that other stuff um so i mean you you mentioned real quick something i want to get into you learned a lot about the business uh i believe it was a at yeah, so many notes I have in front of me right Sorry. now. The front of house, the business side of things. So dive into some of the lessons you learned there. Well, not going to college was um, maybe one regret. I wish I could have gone just so I would have like backup plans, but I was just so punk rock and dead set on being a cook that I didn't. And so when I got the opportunity to work in the front and understand you know, the guest perception and, you know, we're not here cooking for ourselves on a stage. We are here cooking for people and we need to make them happy. And how does that run? And what time do people come in and what's numbers like? And all those things happen. And then working again with Ron and the Daniel Patterson group, being able to understand costs definitely changed my business approach too. just food costs, labor costs, what you got to keep, how, you know, how much money's coming in and out and all those things in the end, we're it's a business. Nightbird is a business. I'm there, obviously, to make people happy um, and cook. But in the end, we need to, uh, you know, awards and accolades are great. But if money's not coming in, you're not going to be open to get anything. Exactly. Yeah, you need that money. It's the fuel. That it's, it's the blood for the veins. It's the fuel to the engine. It's the yeah. We need it to run our businesses. Uh, so we can't just, you know, it, it's good to be passionate. It's good to have other values. But you can't overlook the importance of having, at the end of the day, that cash flow that's going to make your, your, your vision, your mission run. Yeah. So, uh, and I had zero when I opened <laughs> Because <laughs> it took so long to open. Right. Oh, two years, and we'll get into that. Uh, but anything worth mentioning, any transformative times for you, any key lessons, aha moments that you believe have served you to this day uh, before going to, to work th- with the Daniel Patterson group, uh, and that was 2011, to set you up for your success you're having now? I mean, I think that I get aha moments like every week. Um, and growing up, every step I took up, every whether it was turning into a manager or going into a better restaurant, your eyes just became wide open. And, you know, just understanding that every place is different. Every human you work with is is different. And you need to approach all those people differently to be able to have a successful relationship. And you need those relationships to be able to work, to run a restaurant. And um, really just growing up, I guess, you know, every moment just evolving and trying to be a better human and a better communicator and a better chef and a better teacher like i don't think i could pinpoint it was a bunch of pinpoints yeah but just from like 2000 is when you graduated the uh california culinary institute to 2011 which is when you went and you became the executive chef for the daniel patterson group that's 10 years of you getting experience and you need to get that experience you need to let yourself and get that perspective right the, all the different variables the different people you're going to work with i mean the world is a very fluid place and the more places you get in there and the more experience you get the better you're setting yourself up in the future and it looks like what was it six restaurants you worked at eight restaurants you worked at before um, i took a management role yeah yeah so like think about how much that must have served you um so let's let's transition now 2011 daniel patterson group uh how did this opportunity find you or how did you find this opportunity um well i After I left Aqua, I was approached to open a restaurant called Plate Shop in Sausalito, which took almost two years as well. So I did like odd jobs and um, it just after six months just didn't really work the way that it was supposed to. So I parted ways. And in that time, I was going to farmers markets and Daniel approached me and we had a conversation, I think, about potatoes. And um, did you recognize you? Did you know who you were? We my partner had worked for uh, was the do for the daniel patterson group so we had met in gotcha. a couple different environments and he had approached me and so i i said you know like let's work together we ended up working at qua for a while then he offered me the job and then i took over haven and then he moved me to plum and then um moved over i opened up nightbird okay so your partner ron boyd yes. your business partner okay got you and is he your life partner too he is okay gotcha gotcha so um one thing that came into my mind, I know I'm, I was trying to set up the conversation to transition to your time at uh, the Daniel Patterson group, but um, I know something else that's really important to you is mental health and wellness is something that has come up a bunch of times, even just in the pre-interview chat that we we're having. And I know you spent some time working with Jeremy Fox, um, and I know that he's really come out 
uh, recently, and even when he was winning all these awards uh, for best chef and best restaurant, and fill in the blank, he was just had all the spotlight. He says that that was like the most miserable time in his life when he was getting all these awards. And you'd think it would be the complete opposite. Were you with him during that overlay? Um, I'm nodding my head like you can hear me. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's a yeah, camera on you. I, uh, you know, we worked together at Manresa, and then we worked together at Ubuntu, and we stayed friends. I actually was just in L.A. last week uh, cooking for the opening of Birdie's, his mm. first restaurant that he owns and is um, started from scratch. And we were, you know, discussing it back then. But, yeah, it was, I think, a tough time. I mean, the pressure at Manresa was very tough. But moving to Ubuntu and the pressure, you know, Napa didn't embrace Ubuntu right away. It um, Some nights we'd do six people. Yeah, it was a vegetarian, all vegetarian. With a yoga studio. With a yoga studio, yeah. It so was kind of random. Yeah, <laughs> some yeah. And, but he was try he was applying all this, you know, he was actually, like, very focused on meat at Manresa. He taught me how to break down pigs and venison and lambs. And he applied that knowledge and put it towards vegetables and just really, I think, changed the thought process that you can't. You can be interesting and exciting with vegetables. It doesn't have to be a grilled portobello mushroom with balsamic vinaigrette. It can be, you know, roast vegetables like you roast meat. Treat mm -hmm. them the same way. But I think, you know, him and Dini uh, also, they were married at Manresa. They were married at Ubuntu, and they split during that time. And I think that he just, you know, he so much pressure from all the awards, the spotlight that was on him, the expectations of what he should be accomplishing just got to him. I mean, it gets to all of us. We all have this pressure that's waiting on us to, you know, you want the awards and the accolades. You need to run your business. You need to make time for your family and your friends, but it's almost impossible. So you have to start balancing. If you don't have the tools to be able to balance, it gets fucking scary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's weird. It's like a double-edged sword. And in this industry, we, we put so much emphasis on discipline and, and work ethic and showing up and outworking the guy next to you and, and working hardest because if you want people that are working for you to work hard, you have to set that pace. You have to set, set that example. And we work ourselves into like the, this hole, right, that we can't get out of. And it's weird. It's like that double-edged sword where you want to have that work ethic, but we walk that line, right? And... It's one thing that I've pointed out just having uh, that I'm starting to realize through all these conversations is that a lot of the people that we idolize, while they may be incredible people, they also have problems, you know, like we, we celebrate them, but they have problems. And it's usually those problems, those maybe it's being obsessive with something or just, you know, whatever it is, isn't healthy. And we shouldn't feel the pressure to try to recreate that. You know, do you want do you want to reflect on that? Do you agree or disagree? Or am I, I mean, yeah, we're human, right? Like yeah. and things affect us all differently and I mean I can speak for myself in saying that I had thicker skin I think when I was younger than I do now and I have to really work at not because I feel like I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders sometimes at work because you want to make everyone happy it's impossible and then you read a bad review about yourself or one of your cooks isn't you know doing what they should be doing and you I take it on as it's my fault because in the end the chef it's your fault it's my fault if the plumbing's not working, if the, you know there's a hair in the food or whatever it might be, it is my fault. And I just feel like sometimes it's really hard to manage. So it's, uh, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for getting into that. I just wanted to highlight that your time with him because I know it was important to you. But transitioning back to the Daniel Patterson Group, 2011, 2014, was this your first um, management, like, no, I had Big a chef role, role before or? him. It okay. just wasn't as um, publicized because obviously Daniel has a lot of press around him. Mm -hmm. So, and Haven was kind of like a big opening. It was in Oakland and, um, you know, we were a big house. And I think that, you know, I got a little bit more attention through that, obviously. Gotcha, gotcha. So what you said this is really kind of where you learn most of the front of the house, the business aspects. Dive into the biggest lessons that you learned that have served you to this day, the biggest lessons that, are, that continue to serve you to this day? Well, I think that I put a lot of pressure on myself to make, this is going to sound really effed up. But, um, <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I knew if I kept my numbers in check and people happy, I'd get left alone. In the sense of I could cook the food I want to cook, I can run the kitchen how I want to run it, but if my numbers got out of line, someone's going to come in and tell me to fix it. If my food wasn't getting good reviews, someone's going to come in and tell me to fix it. So I like really just always in the back of my head was like, 
run your numbers, make people happy, and you can do what you want. Yeah, and that does not sound effed up at all. I mean, it's called being proactive. It's called treating it like you own it, right? And yeah, if you're I don't want to be told what to do. Yeah, but, but you know, <laughs> if you want to if you want to treat it like you own it, if you want to have that freedom, that creative freedom to do what you want, then treat it like you own it. Mm-hmm. Be on top of the numbers if it was your own business. And when you are proactive in making sure that there's nothing that's going to you know raise any flags or cause any attention, and you, you – you then you've earned the right to, to have that freedom, right? Because you, yeah. you're being proactive. So I don't think it's effed up at all. It's, yeah. it's a great example. Cool. Uh, any other great lessons like that? Um, I mean, that was a big one, like learning and understanding the numbers and learning how to make people happy and cook for – I was cooking for Oakland. I was cooking – which is a little bit different than cooking for San Francisco, even though they're so close. There was a, It was a little – it was obviously more casual, so I was, you know, making sure I always had certain things that hit the notes that people were excited about that would be different if I was cooking in San Francisco. So I really kind of enjoyed that time there. I loved Haven. I loved – the experience that I got and really honing in on numbers. And then I think my, the pressure I put on myself to make sure I kept my numbers in check, uh, have made Nightbird successful. We've been financially successful every single month. Um, a lot of that is cause I'm not running it sustainably. I mean, I go to the farmer's market, I open it up. I I'm on a station, I close it. I do the invoices, I do it all, but like it's made it. So I have been able to pay back most of my investors and we're already looking into another project and trying to, you know, run it i'm running it like a grown-up i love it so you mentioned the numbers being really important you mentioned tracking the numbers to have that discipline uh to be on top of the numbers so you will be left alone but get specific give us a, a specific number related to the numbers um okay. or did i say numbers I'm gonna related call to my, the numbers well, i'm going to call myself like give us like something that we can take and apply in our business okay well two lessons i'm going to say right now I ran the food cost so low at Haven. It was 17.6 for the wow. first like six months that he brought down. Then all the other restaurants got pissed at me because it was a 27% or 25% I was going to say the cost. average is like 30. Yeah, yeah. But he had us, uh, you know, when we had goals and budgets and when we talk about meetings, it was 25%. But I kept it so low. He brought it the whole company wide down to like 23. Ooh. And everyone's <laughs> like, Kim, buy some truffles. Buy something. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. I started buying like foie gras. And I, I have kept in the two and a half years that Nightbird's been open. It fluctuates, but 19.6 for the most part. And that is primarily based i mean we don't have a walk-in and i go to the farmer's market every day so i buy exactly what we need there's almost no waste we've now started reflection courses which turns what would have been thrown away into um, a reflection bite afterwards so we really don't have much waste at all um and you know i i just work really hard to keep you know labor in check and all those things so i can then spend money in other ways obviously spending um, paying back the 1.5 it took me to open to my investors and the loans that i've taken out so i'm i'm gonna pull back another layer here because i feel like this is really great advice especially um i put a lot of emphasis i try to make example of people who are doing food right meaning sustainable and ethical in sourcing locally and i think we need more businesses like that uh existing but the truth of the matter is it's really hard to 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 make money when you're trying to be sustainable when you're trying to do the right thing you know the right thing comes at a cost yeah. right so how are you able to get your expenses down to 17 percent what 19 what, sorry 19 percent still amazing my food cost was 22 percent last <laughs> month but like it, it you know in the summer it obviously goes up well i mean a lot of it is relationships with farmers um the I literally go every day to the farmer's market, so I just get what we have. We don't have a walk-in, so there's so little waste. We are, I get all of my meat and everything from small local farms. I mean, I pay a, a hefty price on everything, but just making sure we use everything. So like an example of a reflection uh, that I would do is um, if we have duck on the menu, every single part of that duck is on. And then we would take the bones and then we turn it into a broth. And then we would take some grains that we had for the gluten-free cracker that we have to have and we'll make that into a broth and add it to it and put a cracker on top so like we're just constantly using everything and I think just I mean like I said it's a little unsustainable for me I work 16 17 hours a day and I am you know on a station I'm picking things up I could totally have two more bodies in my kitchen and I choose not to uh one day hopefully I will (laughs) yeah with the food yeah I really think the fact that I don't have a walk-in that just stuff sits we have the same menu being able to have a tasting menu and having 10 courses um you don't 
you don't have as much waste. Yeah. It's really about that. What I'm really curious about is um, when you're you're ordering, when you're getting your orders, is so accurate where you're getting just what you need. I'm sure you run into the issue where you probably run out every once in a while. It happens a lot. So how so how do you handle that situation where you run out? What is there a, 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 any advice you have for people who are trying to walk that line <laughs> and how to like defuse an angry guest or how to make it, how to sweep it under the rug or maybe? I. Nightbird's in a rad community. Hayes Valley is amazing. It's filled with restaurants with very like-minded chefs and owners who um, we all want to support each other. So like we ran out of scallops the other day. I ran down two blocks to the sushi place. I bought some scallops and I came right back. And I know where he's getting those scallops because he's using the same purveyor as me. Same with like uh, vegetables. I I know which farmers or which chefs are going to the farmer's market and I run and go get them. So we from the i mean we have walk-ins that's another thing i mean really having a tasting menu restaurant makes you to be able to be more sustainable than having an a la carte restaurant because the menu's not as big you don't have as much waste and you know kind of what you're walking into we've jumped up 20 covers and that's the nights that i have to run down and go grab some scallop from the sushi place but for the most part i'm like okay we've got 30 covers tonight i know what i got in the back of your mind you have a backup plan like okay i have like 10 backup plans okay and i think that's another key variable is knowing that there's a good chance it might happen i have like backup plans for tonight yeah and having your backup 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 plan and so you can call that audible when you need to and mm-hmm. to be prepared. And I think the other big thing that you, you emphasize there is relationships. Um, there's going to be a time where the guy down the street is going to have to, you know, you're, they're going to you're going to bail them out, you mm-hmm. know, and it's a give and take. And, totally. and you have to have that mentality of like us, that, that we mentality, not just the people in your business that are immediately under your roof, but in your community. And when you have those relationships, it's so powerful. If I mean, when we first day one of nightbird our dishwasher didn't show up and what did i do i ran to the next door restaurant i'm like oh my god do you know a dishwasher and they're like yeah my morning guy here he is <laughs> you know and then you remember that and you bake them banana bread and you bring it to the next <laughs> day and you Anything. say thank you yeah, and yeah. you know and they come into your bar you give them shots and it's just like this you want to help each other at least i feel like the community that i have um found created been with been a part of for 20 years in san francisco you know, we see each other every day at the market. We want each other to be successful and we are there to help each other. And that without that support, I don't think that we would, I would still be there for sure. Because, you know, you, Hey, how do you do that recipe? And you like text somebody real quick or how, you know, I'm, I can't find this squab this week. Who are you getting it from? All these things happen. There's problems, um, every day. Like my, the one person I got ducks from, uh, the flu happened and the whole farm just got wiped out. They had to kill everything. So the next day I was like, oh my God, start calling all my friends. Like, who are you getting duck from? And right away they introduced you to a new farmer that you didn't know about. So it's, it's, if you don't give back to the community, you're not going to be successful. And that includes, I think, supporting the other chefs that are around you, giving to charities. I mean, we have... a lot of problems right now in San Francisco with homeless and um, Mm. cleanliness and all the and how expensive it is like we're trying to think of ways to buy a building with apartments in it so we could maybe help the staff like yeah these are all things you have to think about because it's becoming unlivable how can we create an environment without us going you know without staff we're not going to be able to survive so what can we do what can we give them okay we're going to pay 100% of the health insurance we're going to make sure they have you know they come in at my cooks coming at two so they can have life in the in the beginning of their day um, the opposite of what I had. I never had health insurance. I never, I went in at seven in the morning. I got paid shift pay. That was shift, not shit, <laughs> even though they might be both. And I worked 16 hours as a line cook making 80 bucks. Like that's just what it was. I try to make sure that my cooks make a livable wage, have health insurance, have two days off. They put up dishes every week to be creative. You know, we're, we're trying to create something that we never had. Kim, I'm loving what you're giving us. I feel like we're going to dive deeper into all that. Uh, really what I want to start to transition into is the the formation of Nightbird, how you cr- made like, you know, the vision, how you made it come to be. So, okay, back to your story. Uh, 2014, I believe, uh, you're now thinking to yourself, it's time to break off. It's time to do our own thing, not my own thing, our own thing. So you have a business partner. Talk about your partner real quick and what what makes your partner your partner as far as like how he um, basically offsets you. I call him my blankie. <laughs> he is my blankie and makes he's not here today, which is crazy. He always comes. And he makes it. He makes it okay. Um, it's amazing because he had been a chef. His parents owned a diner out in the Sunset in San Francisco, and so he's been in the restaurant business since he was twelve. 
uh, w- he had to have neck surgery about eight years ago, which kind of took him out of the kitchen a little bit. So that made him focus more on like running restaurant groups. He's ran a couple different restaurant groups in the Bay Area. And then when Nightbird opened up right away, he wasn't actually at Nightbird. He, we were trying to, didn't want to put all our eggs in one basket. And uh, after a couple months realized, you know what? We need to put all our eggs in a basket. So what was he doing? Was he focusing on trying to maybe open another restaurant? He was the director of operations for a group called Bacchus. And um, he would be at Nightbird. He he was just doing both. And so now he's at Nightbird all the time. And we run a consulting group. So he also consults for restaurants. Um, But for the most part, now he's there every night. He's running the front of the house, which he's never done before. But he just stepped right in that role. Uh, And he is doing the wine list. We... Linden Room, which is our small bar, uh, he does all the cocktails for it. I prep it all. And we just got uh, Esquire's Best Bars in America. Congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, it's rad. He does an amazing job. I wish he'd get more credit for it, but he's kind of always been behind the scenes. But he is a big person who's taught me about the business and about, you know, being creative and having more confidence in myself and all those things. So when did the conversation between the two of you start? when you said like let's let's open our own place like and how did you start living intentionally together to make that happen well honestly uh when i got moved to plum from haven um i would i think it's like nine months in daniel just came to me he's like we're turning plum into an asian restaurant called ume and i was just like okay um what am i gonna do he he was just like it's time for you to open your own restaurant and actually originally he was gonna be a partner with me uh and um it kind of, I, I don't want to say the choice wasn't made, it was given to me, but I think that... What choice? To open my own restaurant. Okay, gotcha. uh, because it wasn't something that I had actually, I mean, obviously you always think about that growing up as, you know, I want to open my own restaurant one day, and um, but it just out of the blue kind of was like, we're closing this restaurant and we're turning to something else. And I just then started thinking about what would be my next step. And my next step just seemed that I, yeah, didn't want to be told what to do, I guess. So I was like, open my own spot. There's always that that possibility when you're working for somebody else that you might put your blood, sweat, and tears into something. If they don't see it working, maybe you think it just needs a little more time to catch on. You ultimately don't have that decision. You don't have that privilege to make that decision. So if you want, you know, that freedom, right, to, to make your own decisions and see things through, sometimes you have to break out on your own well and also i mean you talked about it earlier running a restaurant like it's your own it's very important and i was i don't want to say killing myself but you know i don't think i took a when haven opened literally like month six daniel was like you're taking tomorrow off or i'm gonna fire you because i never took a day off Mm. and we were open seven days doing like 200 covers a day and i was like i'm sitting here killing myself and I'm like, I should kill myself for my own <laughs> exactly, self, yeah. you know, because like my body only has so many more years before, I, you know, working like these hours that I'm doing. Yeah. So we just started the conversation of what it would be and what would financially work. And a big thought, you know, it was a constant conversation with where San Francisco going to be in a few years. Obviously, there's a ton of tech. There's a ton of, you know, money coming in. But at the same time, labor is awful. Everyone's leaving because they can't afford because of all the tech. So and then everyone's all the cooks are kind of going to tech companies or Google or places. And so how can I run a successful business that will make money with limited labor and keeping my costs in check? And to me, that was obviously a tasty menu restaurant. It's me, two cooks and a pastry person and a dishwasher. So. Obviously, I mean, it's not so obvious. I mean, it is kind of obvious, but the, what, are, what are the reasons why uh, you have more control of the tasting menu? Well, you have a limited menu. Uh, we try to be the most, um, we don't say no, really. So someone literally will come in and be like, I'm on the Whole30 diet. And I'll be like, what the F is that? And I'll like <laughs> Google it and then you try. Can have this. Yeah, I'll try my best to <laughs> make a menu. Thing. We had yeah. someone, you know, come in who he just ate potatoes and steak and only French fry style. Pot- I did five courses of yeah. steak and potatoes. Like we will try to make people happy however we can. But uh, pros and cons. Yeah. So, you know, there, I mean, there's prefix basically. Right. So I'm assuming prefix. Yes. Like so tasting menu prefix. Uh, you know exactly. Uh, are you doing uh, using like a reservation platform yeah. like talk? We use, you know, I want to use talk uh, and I've been in talks with them. But for the <laughs> most part. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, uh, Open Table has a very strong grip on uh, the Bay Area, and I'm in the Symphony District, kind of. So we get, s- I'm afraid to go to the ticket s- ticketing system that I'll lose reservations. So we're with Open Table, who is great. They they try to promote us and they help us, but for the most part, they caught a lot of heat for a while, but I think they've recovered well from it. I think they trying. listened. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, they still it's it's expensive. Yeah. You know, I pay over a thousand dollars, almost a thousand dollars a month for Open Table. Um, 
and they i mean so we i would say 90 percent are reservations so you kind of know what you're walking into every day yeah so we you can, can plan jump for up. it and when you're yeah. buying every day and when everything's so fresh you say you know exactly what you have yeah. on the table or exactly. on the books for that day you can buy exactly what you need uh and you can just have that much more control over your expenses and i know with like talk um you're buying a ticket unless so even if people don't show up like, you get that money you're but still getting the money freak out yeah the, we have a cancellation policy and we get yelled at a lot <laughs> just because people you know it's they well you know i think there's it's it's safe to say i think i think that uh society has been kind of um forced into like it, accepting that it's okay to walk all over restaurants and it's gone to a point because it's all about That's hospitality a right? way of saying it you know it's got because <laughs> yeah. we we've but it's it's our fault as the industry because we've yeah. let them get to that point where they like most they just expect to be able to have their way mm -hmm. but it's a business at the end of the day and there has to be a little bit of give and take and i think we're doing a good job as an industry starting to push back and saying like, you're not behaving well like I'm a small business, and like, and we're doing a good job educating the public around these challenges. Um, we're not trying. to get too far off topic. So oh, I could go off another <laughs> topic forever. <laughs> so yeah. back to your story uh, in making this this your vision come to fruition. Um, take us through take us through that that whole experience, mm -hmm. the, the good, the bad, the two years to open. Any hurdles that are worth talking about there? Lessons learned. <laughs> I mean. I, I haven't been talking about the romantic version of this story. <laughs> I mean, obviously cooking a tasty menu yeah. is like, I think most chefs dreams mm -hmm. having a, you know, 30 seat restaurant where you can change the menu at your whim whenever you want. That's it's amazing, but it also is very smart financially and, and on a business side, the hurdles, there was a ton. And I'd have to say the main hurdle uh, was the city. I mean, permitting. Yeah. Permitting. Um, how much money it costs. I mean, two years, I am very lucky to have incredible landlords who ended up becoming investors because I wouldn't have been able to pay $150,000 in rent for a year while it just sat there in construction. So they turned it into like credits and put it into investment and it was able to make me survive. And I um, never, I didn't take a salary. I just like did other jobs. Plus I was the project manager there every day. But I mean, yeah, the city, was a hurdle it's uh, it's already a hurdle i've been in permitting since september to expand and they're quoting me till january 2020 to expand a 700 square foot space but so anything you would have done differently regarding the permitting i mean there's not much you can do but maybe there was something that you learned that you would have done differently that might have sped up the process i would say definitely if you're trying to open a restaurant like expediters always help but that's like an extra what do you uh, mean by expediter you can hire an expediter to we're not talking about the guy standing at the pass right no, now. No, we're talking about the guy who you pay around five grand to just sit in the Who's permitting done it office. A bunch of times. Yeah. And he knows the routine. Mm -hmm. He has a checklist and he's just like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Here you go. Yeah. How or much that's you. How much would you say you would need to budget for something like that? I mean, normally it's around five grand in San Francisco Jeez. for someone to push permits through. You know, some people would be like, five grand? Who has that much money? What's your time worth is the other question. How exactly. much money can you make in a year? Exactly. Right? Speeding exactly. up that process. So yeah. you, you, gotta th you have to think about time as money. Yeah. It's so important in justifying where you spend your money. I mean, if you're getting a loan for $500,000, I don't know how much you guys needed. 250. So when I'm 250, what's $5,000 to yeah. get to what can you make up in that one year if you yeah. invest that money to get the experts on your team, right? It's funny in the beginning when you think about like, I think the first check I wrote for was like $10,000. And I remember having a heart attack being like, holy crap, $10,000. <laughs> then I started writing checks for $150,000. And I was like, <laughs> you don't even care anymore. Because it just costs so much money and all these expenses you don't think about. I didn't think about lawyer expenses, mm. like on how much that would be. I didn't think about, you know, just there's so many things that you don't think about. Researching your construction company, I think, is definitely key. Yeah. Um, and making sure you're with someone who knows what they're doing, did knows the permitting. Did you a couple mistakes there? I did. Want to get into it? Uh, uh, one lesson? A little bit of a Oh, uh, okay. I don't want to push too far. There. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, definitely construction. And then also just making sure that you're really honest with your landlord and having a good relationship with them and getting... Like, I don't even think I started cooking until three days before we were going to open. I didn't know what the menu was going to be. I was so focused on everything else. I'm going to stop you right there so I can summarize as much as I can before kind of trying to get more nug nuggets out of you. And I'm loving this conversation. Uh, doing the time, we're thinking about uh, the, the, the people, the, the the specialists you can invest in, right? So uh, whether it's an expediter, a lawyer, or the, the, con the, 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 the contractor or whatever you're working with to build it out, uh, think about these people and, and work that into your budget and try to get what you need to do it right the first time right totally. um is that a good way to p paraphrase yeah for sure but you know it's funny when i'm giving advice i've got a couple cooks who used to work for me or opening restaurants now and i'm trying to help them and give them knowledge and letting them do pop-ups at nightbird but the first thing i always tell them is find a turnkey like don't 
go into a space you don't know what you're going to find when they start opening up unless you have unlimited funds which yeah. none of us do but i know my budget doubled yeah and it's you know i've paid a lot of it off but every day when i'm thinking about do i want to buy that do i want that new pasta machine do i want this and i'm like nope i gotta pay my investors back so it's like if you had a turnkey and you could just paint and you could just cook amazing food you definitely need to have a beautiful ambiance it's such part of the experience now you need to create this experience for people their perception of value is different yeah. than what it used to be and what people expect they want to they want to feel important. They want to sit in a great place. But like the less money you can spend opening, the better for you in the yeah, end. Yeah, and, and if anybody's listening to this and they're, they're not familiar with the, the term turnkey, it basically means an operation that has the systems, processes, or usually just equipment. But even if it's a, a business that's already going and you can kind of move in and make, make tweaks as you go. But that turnkey, if you can be someone's exit strategy, if somebody gets into the industry and they put all the money up and they realize after a day that it's a lot of work and they want to get out, that's those exit strategies are great opportunities and you can usually find a turnkey that way uh do you want to add on to that yeah i mean this sounds very vulture-y i it's it's you real. know how i found my spot well four different restaurants i spent about i only wanted to be in one area and so i went to a couple different restaurants and i you know found out who the broker you know the owner was not necessarily i'd never really approached the chef or the owner of the restaurant found asked my broker to ask the business owner uh, if they were interested in selling and it actually had two people ended up leaving their spots because they didn't realize how many people wanted to to buy that's a good way to find a spot you want that you think that you could walk into without having to do too much work um, restaurants unfortunately close every week it's so sad when I'm on eater and I see you know another one shutters and it's it's a bummer but it's really hard and a lot of I think failure comes from not having enough capital and putting way too much money in like having too many plates too much equipment um, pay, you know too many architects and designers and then when you get down to it you're not making enough money to turn and pay those people back and pay your staff yeah I think I, I agree with you I want to compound on that and say that I think a lot of people they have this vision when they decide that they're going to make or become a restaurant owner, they have this vision for, for what their perfect restaurant is, right? Nothing and they is perfect, And they guys. compare their <laughs> restaurants to, like, you know, like the Danny Myers of the world who have buku bucks behind them. Like, they can build a restaurant on Mars if they want to because they have the money to back them. They didn't start like that. You know, the, the people that you're comparing yourself to took years to yeah. get there. And they've developed a reputation. And they start where you can. Where, where you can and sustain your lifestyle, start there. Whether that's a a cart at a farmer's market or dinner parties at your house. Yeah. Start there. You don't have to go for the big bang on day one. Um, just to, what, to close off that thought that you shared. Uh, anything else? Um, actually, you know what I want to talk about, what you brought up, is your investors. You, you stress the importance of good, good relationships with your investors. Talk about your relationship with your investors and the, what advice you have to, to set that up. Okay. I have, I want to say, very strong relationships with my investors. I had one set that I didn't have strong relationships with and I had to end up buying them out, um, which caused, you know, a big hurdle, a couple hundred thousand dollars that you need to pay someone out in the middle of you trying to open a restaurant or like deep into it. There's a bigger story behind it, but um, it was really difficult. And so I make sure that I, anything that happens, I bring my investors involved. I let them know things that I want to, they have no, t I don't want to say they don't have any rights to tell me what to do, but I want it to be a conversation. I want them to know when I was going to expand, I'm like, this is what I'm thinking, guys. What do you think? These would be the numbers. Uh, this is what I think the, you know, your payback on the return would be, but it might not be as much of a return right now. What do you think? Every, uh, you know, award we might get or, you know, dinner we're going to do, I send it to them. I cook at their house. Um, I have, you know, text conversations where, because I've leaned on all of them, I've leaned on one of them, like right when we open, I'm like, hey, can I borrow $75,000, which is a crazy thing to ask, but to some of my investors, that's, that's a penny. Yeah, it's a drop in a box. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. which is crazy. Right. Um, and you know what? They wrote me a check and I, they're like, pay it back in three months, no interest. And I'm like, cool. And I did. You know, you got to show respect for the people who had faith in you. And I try to, you know, let, I feel such a responsibility to pay them back. I barely pay my, I pay myself less than I made as a sous chef at Aqua, which pisses off my partner, but I want to make sure that I can, I just don't want that debt hanging over my head. Well, I don't I mean, want that's, that. That's good. I mean, that's like money management one-on-one pay debts off first, you yeah. know, and as you start paying off those debts, don't start putting more back into like whatever that first amount of debt was that you paid off compounded onto um, the next bill that you're paying. So you mm -hmm. have like that fixed amount that you're putting towards your debt. Uh, and then you just pay it off as fast as possible. Yeah. Um, 
So what I'm getting from you is just transparency. The word transparency is coming to my mind, which is being super transparent and open and honest with your investors. Is there something I miss? Is that the general no, gist? No, that's a perfect word. I send them financials every three, four months. I make sure that they are 100% aware of what's going on. Um, if there's ever an issue, I, am, I let them be made aware of it because if they found out separately or if I was Distrust. lying, I mean, then I don't want to ha- be in a relationship with people who don't trust me or exactly. who don't respect me. And I don't want them to come to my restaurant and be upset. I want them to be stoked when they come in. And I think that they are and they want to support me. They bring their friends in. They um, don't trip if I, you know, when I said I was going to expand, they're like, okay, well, don't give us uh, any cash this year. And I still did. I'm like, nope. I'm still going to at least do one payment, like just so you guys don't get, you know, killed on your taxes because I want you to know that I care about what you're, you know, I care about you. Yeah, I love it. Um, any other pieces of advice as far as uh, going? I mean, we haven't really even talked about opening and being open. We've kind of alluded earlier about the importance of taking care of your team and management and culture, those things. Uh, but what, you're open now, right? You opened 2016. Uh, so, Anything worth talking about, lessons learned about being a first-time business owner? Because you've been in kitchens for a long time. This is your first business. What else can you bring to the table? I mean, it was all so much in the beginning because, again, like I said, we opened with no capital. I opened up short-staffed. Um, but in the end, we were all successful. I would just say that, you know, making sure that you're you're making your customers happy, you're treating your staff well, um, just showing respect to the product, to the industry, being a part of your community, like giving up your days off to go do events, like getting your name out there. All those things are important. It's not just cooking. It's like everything outside of cooking. You are a therapist, a plumber, uh, everything, you know? So how do you set your business up that in a way that um, you can be all these different people? You can wear all these different hats uh, and you don't get kind of overwhelmed by all that and i do get overwhelmed <laughs> that's I, i'm still trying to work on that it's funny when i opened you, you mentioned you're still in the kitchen so oh yeah. like this is the longest yeah. i've ever so we're in new york right now my girls fly back tomorrow morning i fly back on thursday and then i literally drive down to la we you said your girls you're talking about your team my team yep. sorry i i just tell them downstairs i call my girls because <laughs> i think they're more than cooks and they're just strong women who i trust um, and respect so they are gonna fly back down run the restaurant I fly back on Thursday then I drive down to LA then oh I goodness. drive back up and then I fly to Taiwan for 10 days Jeez. I have never been away from the restaurant more than four days um, I don't have a sous chef so it's I call in friends to help me but I'm sure your restaurant's open right now uh yeah yeah so <laughs> my part this is well, my partner this is one of the first times he's not flown with me there because we've never both uh, not been at the restaurant at the same time but so we're both going to Taiwan so, so what so. things are in your business to allow you to get this type of exposure, to get away, to get this type of, of good public exposure, while also making sure your, your business is running. What, what things are in place at your business to make it the, the, the wheels still turn with you out not being there? Definitely my partner. I mean, because he, I trust him in the kitchen and in the front, obviously. Uh, I bring in friends who are in between jobs right now or, at, you know, doing private chefing and want to get back in the kitchen. And luckily, like, you know, we support each other and, and that makes it easy. I trust my staff. Um, and we, you know, having a tasty menu, we have everything like in notebooks. We know exactly what it is. I have someone else go to the farmer's market. And it comes. And so it, it hopefully runs, I wouldn't say exactly like a machine, but. So would you say you're more culture dependent or more systems dependent? I mean, I'd like to say, I'd say that we lean on both. I probably more culture. You need both. You yeah, need both. probably more culture. But I mean, we have all the systems in place. We have like all the financials, all of our corp sheets. We have all of our recipes. But in the end, I feel they're all just base. At mm-hmm. least like recipes and things like that. Every time I think every apple is going to be different. Yeah. You know, every cherry is going to be different. So you have to adjust to what it is. Every person is going to be different. Every every day there's always going to be a little curveball thrown at you. So you need to use what you've learned and apply that. And yeah. I, that's what I try to teach my staff. And I feel like I'm a broken record because I always put the emphasis on, on partnerships. I I, tech, I know there's a lot of people out there that believe partnerships are the worst thing to get into when it comes to business and especially the restaurant industry. But with how competitive the industry is getting, I don't see how you stay competitive without a partner, something with skin in the game. So you can trust them to be there to, to run the business when you have a, a public event that you have to attend or an opportunity to pursue um, thoughts on that. Well, I mean, 
I agree and disagree. It's crazy. Like <laughs> my partner got into Nightbird every day because because of trust. We we felt like we couldn't trust someone with with um, running and the finances who would care as much as we would. Obviously, this is our life. You know, we're putting blood into it. And but at the same time, I've had bad partnerships mm. with that went south and uh, you just need to really know the partner you're going in with what's different about this partnership sorry i cut you off there what's different about this partnership where there is that trust that the business can hinge on um well this is also good and bad we are partners in life and we have been for 12 years um and he i trust him with my life and i think that you know it, it obviously affects our personal relationship it I don't know anyone who works with their partner and is with them in a stressful environment 17 hours a day, seven days a week that it doesn't, but it also makes our professional relationship stronger and our business. We trust each other. I don't have to like worry, but we have to work really hard to make our personal relationship yeah. work and not want to murder each other. I think it's, there was, a <laughs> it sounds so bad. This kind of fluffy Valentine's day piece came out and it was all couples and I answered really honestly <laughs> and they answered like a, it was a question well, like what what you know um, all the other chefs answered very fluffy and they said something to me like what's the hardest part about working with your partner and I'm like not wanting to murder him every day <laughs> and everyone else was like not having enough time what to spend and I'm like no nope, I just don't want to kill him <laughs> well I mean, I mean there's a lot of people listening to this um, that are probably in business with their uh, life partner, not just their business partner. Uh, so what's one piece of advice you have to, to keep that sanity and not kill each other? Take some time for yourself, for sure. Like not saying put yourself above anything, but just make sure that you have private time for you and that you're taking care of your health and your body. Mm -hmm. I mean, any free time I have, it is spent on acupuncture or, you know, health, uh, 12 shots like all those things to make sure <laughs> that I can survive yeah and then making sure that you set a times you know with your partner that isn't just talking about work which is hard like we have yeah. to really focus like what can we talk about that isn't about work I'm assuming it's like what it's like when you have kids and you go out to dinner and you're like let's not talk about the kids let's because th they are our family they, they are our kids our staff so we're like well, let's not talk about them let's talk about something else let's talk about our dog <laughs> <laughs> you know just uh, making time man we've covered a lot in this conversation uh, but I want to make sure we're not leaving anything out anything that you really want to talk about we haven't talked about the bar that you added on Was that those open together or separately the linden room it was the same like so it's in the same space which is like 1400 square feet but i wanted two separate entities that were symbiotic at the same time Why? so because i i wanted nightbird to be something that was i could grow into i didn't want to have a very stylized space and this is what we're doing because you know what if i look back at what we were doing three years ago i'm like oh you know you because we are evolving we are changing we are growing and I wanted Linden Room to be very exact. It is very 1920s New York Hotel was my inspiration. Mm. And, you know, my record players there, vintage glassware is there. And we have a very, you know, strong system of what kind of cocktails we have and what we're prepping for it. And then Nightbird just is very, a little bit more loose. It's very organic. It's like, okay, well, what are we going to do today? Our menu right now is colors for pride. So every course is a different color. And uh, Linden Room is just very, you know, we have seasonal cocktails, classic cocktails, and we play like Ray Charles and you know you have a good drink and then you move on so i just wanted to i wanted a place i like to drink in and a place i like to eat in awesome um anything we have not discussed up to this point that you're you're hoping to bring to the table something of value you could bring to the table that we can mesh out now before moving to the speed round i'd like to think i brought some stuff to the table you brought a ton <laughs> i've loved it no um i think that we've kind of touched on a lot of things that at least you know i would like to hear about when i was opening a restaurant and you know trying to run one it's 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 hard in in a city like san francisco where the prices are insane and being I'd never like to fall on being a woman, but it definitely affected uh, me getting investment. It definitely affected, um, it affects a lot. And uh, I think that we overcame that at Nightbird just because, you know, we all push really hard. I love it. So this is a question I'm asking all my guests before going to the speed round. And the mission statement is to transfor transform the industry, right? So we're here to try to transfer the transform the industry with your knowledge. How have you transformed since 2000, getting out of culinary school to who you are today? Uh, who are you today? Who's Chef Kim today versus who you were back then? I've changed a lot. Thank God. And I mean, <laughs> you know, I hope that everyone does in, in that long of a time. But I, when I was a cook, it was uh, more of like a pirate, sh pirate ship. That's how I always explain it. You know, we were in chaos and, you know, drinking and drugs and 
just uh, trying to be better than the person next to you because it was a competition. Like you would get fired if you weren't better than the person next to you. So everything was a race. And sometimes there wasn't as much camaraderie because it, I mean, obviously I'm still friends with almost everyone I cooked with uh, growing up and I'm so grateful to those experiences that I had. But the people who didn't make that cut, like we were terrible to. And now you can't be terrible to people. You have to like embrace them, teach them, or else you're not going to have someone who's going to stand by you. So we... I have changed. I'm more of a teacher. I'm really shocked. I was very impatient. I'm still pretty impatient, but I have so much more patience than I ever did. And I want to teach and I want, you know, my cooks to grow to, you know, surpass me and get awards and accolades and have successful businesses. And I could be proud that I was a part of that. We're back, and the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? You know, I want to say being humble, like going back to Suzette for sure, because it makes, I think people want to work with, hopefully with me, and it makes me push harder to be better, and and you know what, hardworking. <laughs> I work fucking hard. Work ethic and being <laughs> yeah. humble, I love it. What is your biggest weakness? Um... I'm trying to think which one is the worst, which I could tell about. <laughs> I mean, you know what? It's it's totally a hindrance and a, and a not because we're, I feel like I have to go in and support my staff and work hard. So I'm not sometimes going out and doing things to promote the restaurant or to, you know, grow as a human and as a chef. And, you know, I can't be a prep cook for the rest of my life, which I'm kind of a prep cook right now. And I know <laughs> it's a hindrance, too. Uh, what is one question you ask or thing you look for during your interview process when you're building your team? How are you hiring? You know, it's it's funny. I always say that I can teach anyone to break down a cow or bake bread but I can't teach you not to be an asshole so I really look for personality and if they mesh well we're such a small team and um, you can't change can't change a lot of a lot of things about people so I really like want to talk with them about who they are what their goals are where you know they see themselves and you know how how they treat other people next to them i just want to point out i think we're growing closer together because as this interview evolves you started abbreviating your curse words now you're just sorry. saying i'm out there sorry, so sorry, I'm sorry. no i don't uh, nothing it's just <laughs> i think it's just kind of i mean an <laughs> i'm actually on my best behavior because we're at the james beard house and i know it's gonna be fil- i told all my girls i'm like no cussing after six but uh i i just <laughs> want to tease you a little I bit think, i think <laughs> i think like in the interviewing process i definitely watch how they treat the dishwasher i see if they introduce themselves to him and same with servers. I We have two new servers, and I was like, what's the dishwasher's name? And one of them knew his name, and one of them didn't. And the guy who didn't know his name, he no longer works with us. And uh, that was three days ago. I love it. And I'm not saying that's why, <laughs> but I'm just saying that shows character. It does. Uh, what is your biggest challenge today? Today, in general, or today, actually today? <laughs> uh, in general, today, whatever is your biggest challenge that comes to mind first thing that comes yeah. to mind how the, are you getting past it the first thing that comes to mind is multiple things but definitely i mean the city uh but we're having so many issues in san francisco the homeless problem is insane and it affects my business in a negative way I'm sorry. Uh, customers aren't coming down as much every morning i have to wake somebody up from my 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 area of the restaurant when i'm walking in and it's it it really weighs on you because you want to help them but at the same time you start losing empathy because it gets old cleaning up poop and needles Ugh. And I know that sounds, I'm sorry, but it's, that's it's unfortunately, it's, it's every I, I, day, it's I, a struggle. I want this show to be real, and that's that's the state of many cities right now. Yeah. Um, and it has to be spoken about yeah. because it, it has to be brought to the surface. Um, what is one uncommon standard of service you teach your team, a way to be, a way to act? I'm sorry, I asked that question wrong. I just skipped one. Just answer that question. Sorry. I, <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure, I'm going to ask you the right <laughs> question. Share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team, a way to be, a way to act. I try to say that, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things and it's really about how we treat each other as people and, you know, treat each other like humans and treat each other with respect and try to learn from every person that's next to you. And if you, you know, that's that's the the main one, I think. I dig it. What is one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? This is a way to go above and beyond what's expected from the guest. Well, my back of the house team is also part of the front of the house team. So they um, run food and are a part of the process. And I think it's important for them as cooks to A, see that appreciation on people's faces. But I think that it makes them more comfortable. I think it also gives them an idea of like if they're making people happy, if people are upset, they've been treated terribly, they've tr- been treated great. And I think that it's it's a really important for a cook to see that just to start understanding what it's really like. You know, get that criticism, get that appreciation, but it's you're going to get them both. What's one book that's a must? to make us a better person or a restaurant owner um 
when do I, I'm ter- I feel terrible. My mom's a librarian, <laughs> and I have like 30 books that I've started like in multiple parts. Like I definitely have heard the audiobooks of Danny Meyer, which my partner reads all the time. But for uh, to make you a better person, I mean, that's I have no idea. I could tell you what cookbooks. I mean, I make all my cooks take the art of fermentation because I love it. Those I've are two books right there. Those there are two go. good ones. Okay. The art of fermentation, I think, which is the first or maybe second time I mentioned on the show, and then Danny Meyer's, which is by far uh, the most recommended book on the show, setting the table, uh, the transforming power of hospital. Uh, great book you gotta check out I'll link to both those in the show notes and you mentioned that your partner listens to setting the table on audio and that's one tool that I cannot stress enough Um, not only because audible is an affiliate but because audiobooks can can, like they will transform your life especially for restaurant operators who has the time like you said to sit down and read a book but you can listen to which is terrible please read books please go to libraries or just listen right like you you can you can do your prep you can listen to a book on your commute to work like you can listen you can always be influencing yourself head over to audibletrial.com slash unstoppable if you're not taking advantage of the power of audiobooks you will not regret it Uh, what is one piece of technology you've adopted within your four walls that has had a huge impact on operations I hate saying this, but social media. I mean, I'm terrible at it, but I definitely need to be better yeah. at it. But, it, you know, I, I can see a bump in reservations when we start really posting. And I, I put a reminder on my phone. I've already done a couple of stories today. Like, it's something that I need to change because it's not a part of my life that I really embrace. I'm, I'm right there with to. you. I, you know, some people... Uh, I feel I, I, I sympathize for the people who are like anti social media because not all of us like to live our life in front yeah. of a screen or in a computer. We like the physical world. Right. And I, I'm, I'm one of those people. I'm right there with you. So how are you overcoming? But you can't deny the power no, of good social power. media. So how are you overcoming your your resistance towards social media? Beating it in my brain, putting <laughs> reminders in my phone, knowing that it's, you know, it's amazing the things that change when you own a business. Things that I said I would never do or consider, I consider now because I'm responsible for people's lives, uh, in, meaning my staff, their, their, their financial being. I, I need to be a part of that. So I need to sometimes make bends in what I don't agree with um, to do that. And, you know, whether that's being on TV, which I never said I wanted to do, now I totally consider it or, you know, social media and about things that I'd rather keep private um, because obviously emotional posts are looked at more than than not and and I just kind of try to be more open to that and knowing that people want to understand this we're not just chefs anymore we're activists we're leaders you know leaders we're all these things our voice can be heard I was at the James Beard boot camp a few months ago and for snap and just knowing that we could you know make a change for people that we'll never meet is important you need to be those people who can have the voice when someone in you know who, d- who doesn't have that opportunity yeah awesome stuff this is the last question it's a doozy oh god get ready for it I don't know if I read this one. <laughs> Here we go. if you got the news you'd be leaving this world tomorrow all the memories of you your work in your restaurants would be lost with your departure with the exception of three pieces of wisdom you could leave behind for the good of humanity and for your legacy what would those three pieces of wisdom be Things you know to be true. Put your head down and work hard. That's one. Treat people with respect. Two. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think. I'm still stuck on the fact that I would die and everything would like go far away. Because then I wouldn't say something smart ass, but I'm not going to. <laughs> um, you know, those would be the two that I would leave behind. Awesome. I love it. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much, Chef Kim. Thank we you for having me. <laughs> we wrap up every chat. It's my honor. Uh, to By asking uh, my guest to call somebody out. So who is one independent restaurant operator, somebody you respect and admire and believe would make a great guest mentor like you made for us today? Well, I think because we were talking about him earlier, Chris Cosentino comes to mind right away. Yes. Like he's rad and he has helped me and supported me and, you know, has been a great voice in the community of San Francisco. And, you know, now he's opening multiple restaurants in other states and cities. So I think he'd be great. Chris, look out. I'm coming after you. I'd love to get you on the show and let the folks at home know how can we connect with you if we want to follow your work, uh, social handles, emails, if maybe want to come join your team, anything along those lines. What's the best way to connect? Me. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Were we just talking about social media and then for a minute I dozed off? No, I'm kidding. Sorry, I'm thinking about what I got to prep for this no, dinner No, no, it's, yeah, you get a big <laughs> meal ahead of you. Um, I think my social on Insta is Kim Alter and Nightbird, I think, is Nightbird SF. All right, beautiful. Chef Kim Alter, we'll look that up and make sure and we'll have the links in the show notes. If you head over to restaurantunstoppable.com slash 678, we'll have a summary of today's discussion, a link's 
to any books or tools recommended and um, how to connect with Chef Kim over there. Again, thank you so much. Uh, there is no questioning. You are unstoppable. <laughs> thank you. Cheers. <laughs>